podcast. All right. Hello, Jeff Manchester, Manchester Music. Welcome back. Time for a vodcast. Beer cast in this case. I'm drinking Asahi in honor of Japan, uh, from which I returned yesterday. <laughs> Twice in one month going to Tokyo. Insane. And I have to get back on the road on Wednesday uh, to America. So I'm trying to get a vodcast in between. And I feel like I have a big rush to get a vodcast out just because there has not a been a video on this channel in some time and b there's not been a vodcast in some time and these vodcasts are by far head and shoulders more fun to make than a lot of the other videos that i do on this channel it's just me talking and drinking i think i do one of those things pretty well so Let's jump in. If you want to ask a question, it might take me a year to <laughs> read your email and decide to look you in the eye and, and answer it on the Chan, but vodcastpodcaster at gmail.com. That's where you find me. At Jeff Manch on Twitter is where I'm also pretty active. I'm doing more Instagram stuff now, especially as I get into photography. So um, if there's a way <laughs> to connect with me uh, on Instagram and you want to do that, I'm, I think it's like a DM or something, DM me there. Um, anyway, it's all interconnected. It's all it's all internet. It's all Bitcoin now, and you can get in touch. And please do that. Vodcast, podcast, or Gmail. If I haven't answered your question, by the way, and you've asked it, it's been some time. This channel's been around for like two years. There's a good chance... I have already uh, answered a question that you are asking new person to the channel in a previous vodcast. So just go back and watch the old vodcasts. Go back and watch them. Um, but let's jump into it. We're going to talk about what's going to be a little bit of a mix review. Take your phone away from the speakers so as to avoid RF. There's going to be um, talk about audio engineering school and where ideas and thoughts and stuff comes from when you're making cues and all the rest of it. Um, mixing versus mastering the lot. Anyway, tuck in. Here we go. Okay, so I got a question on a video, which I'll link uh, somehow, title card, whatever, there. Um, and it was anatomy of a cue, how I compose. The question is from R2 Silvast, I think his name is. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for a very informative video. I'm also curious about what happens before this stage. I'm sure it depends on the director, but how do you start composing a score for a film? Do you work on a theme and then use that as the basis, or do you work on the soundtrack cue by cue? So, um, R2, I've done videos on this. Um, they haven't really been, you know, dedicated with the title, like how I start composing or whatever. Um, so it might be hard to find the answer, but I have the answer to this question embedded in different vodcasts and all the rest of it, but I can do my best to sum it up for you here. Um, the answer is it is very case by case in that if I have a director and usually that's the relationship, it's not a producer or whatever, it's usually the director. And if the director says, you know, um, I have a very particular vision for what I want the music to be, um, let's talk about it. And then we'll go that route and I will listen to their, uh, feedback and input. We'll have a cue sheet filled out. If you don't know what that is, basically kind of an Excel sheet, um, with time code, title of the scene, uh, area of the queue, and notes about what kind of music they want. That's something that we usually fill out together, or I typically send to them, and they will fill it out and return it to me, and that's kind of our roadmap from which, you know, that's my roadmap from which to work uh, for a film. So there's no surprises when I go and hand in cues. They're slotted where the scenes are according to the director, and it's very simple. Um, and then I get the... I get the other uh, thing, which I, I seem to get a lot of and I, I really enjoy, which is um, I want you to just do whatever you want. Um, for a lot of people, that kind of lack of um, parameters can be a little daunting, can be a little like paralysis by analysis. There is an asterisk to that. Um, usually the directors that have asked me to, to compose in that spirit, in that way, um, are usually folks that... Um, I've worked for before and we have a kind of trust built up and that's really really important it's not often the case that a, a, a director will just say I've heard your music I know what you do um, I don't know anything about music have at it 
Um, but when you do get that opportunity, it's a lot of fun because you can bring your own thoughts and ideas to a film. And in a way, you are kind of an auteur. You are someone that has something to say and you have stories to tell, not with, you know, light and editing, but with music. And when you're trusted to bring that story and to help contribute, I guess, to someone else's vision with what you do, um, it can be a lot of fun as opposed to having your hand held and being told, I want this to sound like that, and I want this to sound like that, and this to sound like that. So I find that just personally for me, when I have a lot of latitude to be creative, um, that's when I can just uh, basically just start, you know, finding stuff that I want to fill into the cue sheet on my own. And the process for that is usually, um, to be honest with you, it's, it's, I will go and I will find something in the wild that I really love and try and find a way to shoehorn it into the film that I'm working on. So a lot of people might kind of shudder at this approach because it sounds like you're just kind of stealing someone's work or whatever. But really, when you think about it, anything you start, anything creatively that you start in your life starts from you trying to do what someone else has done. And before you know it, you are in a new direction and a new path that has your kind of voice in there. I remember talking to, uh, I can't remember if it was Daniel James or someone about, uh, and he was saying how, you know, things are, everything that you do is usually, not everything, but it's a combination of three different sources, three different artists or sources. Maybe it was Christian Henson. I wasn't talking to Christian Henson about this, but I thought I was. Anyway, not Christian, Daniel. But anyway, someone said three different sources, combine them, and then from there, something new is built. I think that's largely true. It doesn't really take three for me. It's usually one where I will see again something I love in the wild, and I will try to incorporate it into the thing that I'm working on. And everything works this way. I mean, if you love art, then you will find a style that you really love an artist or someone that you look up to and you will try to copy their images you know before you know it you realize that you don't have their (laughs) their technique or whatever you don't have their exact voice but something new comes out of you covering it i mean if anyone who's watched this channel has ever been in a band the first thing you do when you go to rehearsals the first thing when you're trying to get to know whatever is what songs do we know? And you try and cover something, you know, like, do we all know, I don't know, the sweater song by Weezer or like something by Radiohead and you cover and you get a feel for things. And before you know it, the same chords that were used in that Radiohead track make up the basis for something new. And you just jam starting with a cover and it goes somewhere else. Um, Photography, you know, you see a beautiful photograph, then you go into your own city and you try and recreate with the same composition and lighting and whatever it happens to be. And from there, something new is created. Um, I don't think anyone sits there with the lights off and the internet off and just goes into a zone and creates something from scratch or just kind of sits there like some satellite waiting to be, you know, filled with inspiration. That can happen, um, but it's very, it's not common for me anyway. It's It's been the case where sometimes I'm walking down the street and my mind is, is somewhere else and all of a sudden a melody for something will come to me and I'll grab my phone and I will literally hum with voice memos into the phone and then save it as like melody, potential idea idea. How often do I go back to those voice memos to listen uh, to those melodies? Seldom. It's super rare. Usually what it is, is I am, like I said, I am given a lot of latitude by a director, and then I just go into research mode. I watch films that I think are close to the films that this director is making, or I watch stuff that has really inspired me recently. I go back, I find what is the connective tissue? What's the DNA behind all this really awesome stuff that I love? And I try and make my stuff sound like it. And with enough time and enough practice and mistakes, something new comes out of that. And I usually find a way to shoehorn it into the scene that I happen to be working on. It's not one-to-one all the time. Like, for example, I've got this movie coming up, the short film, which is mostly jazz-based. Um, and I don't know anything about jazz, so I'm going to research a lot of jazz stuff, find a style that I can kind of emulate, and hopefully from those sessions, from you know, just fiddling around and playing with presets and patches and whatever my keyboard can do with respect to modes and you know, common modes that are in jazz, I'm not even sure what they are at this point. Maybe it's like Mixolydian or something. I will develop something new and be able to find a way to put that in a queue for a film. But for a lot of other people, it's just, you know, it's, they want someone to go 
put the put in the cue sheet the music that you want me to make and give me you know the sound alike stuff give me the youtube link with the thing that you want me to sound like and that's a great way for them to work so there's no right or wrong way there's a lot of different approaches but more often than not i am just copying i'm covering stuff and you don't want to do note for note obviously but from that session something really new and exciting will emerge and hopefully the people that you're making the music for the director the producer whoever it happens to be on the film will go along and be on board and be really moved by whatever it is that you have borrowed and mosaicked from and that'll be what you do that's what i do that's what i will be doing with this upcoming short film is just watching a lot of jazz stuff and seeing what inspires me um i find for for me anyway a really amazing place to start um is uh is pixar i don't know what it is but pixar movies just have an incredibly wide amazing palette of sounds to them and not just the big ones, not like Incredibles and Toy Story and stuff, but the short films that play before a Pixar movie, the silent film. Like, they're not silent, but there's usually no dialogue. It's, you know, it's a story about a dog or a couple of volcanoes or whatever, and it's just music. And that music is often so inspiring to me for the shorts that I'm working on. It's so delight-driven and emotional and powerful. And I try and see what sample libraries and stuff I have in my DAW that can emulate kind of the tone and the color palette that those... Um, those films um, use and that's where I'll go I did this one uh, film called I Fub You a little while ago and it was a black and white film silent for the most part and I watched um, I think it was called Piper which was I think a Pixar short film and I watched another one called um, I think it was called Paper Man and it was another short film I think from Disney Pixar they're one and the same but anyway and those two films together with some other ideas that I had really informed the voice and the sound of I Fub You that I was working on. And I had a little video where I discussed that. I'll maybe link that there too. Um, that kind of got me thinking about how I'd compose uh, cues for that film. So that's my method. Hopefully it's helpful uh, to you, R2. Hopefully I'm saying your name properly. Let's jump to the next question. This one comes to us from Maria. She goes, good evening. My name is Maria. Uh, I'm from Barcelona. Is it Barcelona? I don't know. Barcelona, Spain. And I'm 17. Uh, going on 18. No, she goes almost 18. That's from The Sound of Music, Maria, which is perfect for your name, Maria. It's a movie you probably don't know what the movie is because 17 is like really young now and i'm old but anyway you should watch sound of music it's like a perfect movie found her channel on youtube she writes wanted to contact you awesome currently she says i'm deciding on what i'm gonna study next but i have some options um, but i get so interested in becoming a composer however during all my teen life i didn't study anything about music but fortunately as a child i learned some piano and music theory she writes in brackets, I know the names of the notes. I'm writing, she says, because I, I would like your advice. Do you think that it's possible to become a composer in four to five years? Not only to have a degree, I mean, live working as one too. <laughs> Thank you for all your effort and the info that you put in your videos. Yours sincerely, Maria. Maria, thank you very much for the question. Um, so I'd like to kind of dig into the question and just recalibrate a few things and contextualize a few other things because I have a lot to say about this question. First off, you're 17. You have a lot of life ahead of you. Um, a lot of life ahead of you. In fact, if you wanted to spend the next four to five years becoming a composer and make that like the sole focus of the end of your teens and the beginning of your 20s, I'd say don't do it. I'd say do a bunch of other life stuff and travel because like you're in this amazing window of time where um, <laughs> you can you, you have not that much responsibility. Really, I don't know your life, but like in your 20s, like you've just got this like early 20s, late teens you can travel you you know depends on your situation but like no kids and all the rest of it you're going to go into university or whatever like there's just this really awesome time and like it just makes me sad to think that anyone would be spending four to five years head down not that this is what you're going to do but like head down tunnel visioning into becoming a composer it's just it doesn't make any sense to me in fact i think you will be an even better composer if you don't spend all your time focusing on composing during that four to five year half decade window and just spend more time just like being 
young and alive and carefree, low risk, low responsibility, and just living life and then taking everything that you've learned and then maybe tunnel visioning and focusing on music later on. Um, and really informing and coloring your music with all the things that you did and the places you went and the people you met and the instruments you came across and the stories and all that stuff. Like, it's such a cool thing to be 17 going to like, you know, 23, 22. Um, and it just kind of hurts my heart to think that anyone would, you know, spend half a decade trying to become a composer. So anyway, just for whatever that's worth, I don't think there's any rush to go in and do this now. And, and, and like I said, and just dedicate your life to, to doing something by the time you hit your early twenties. Um, I didn't decide to really take audio seriously until I was in my late twenties, which is not what you're asking here, but I just feel like I should qualify my answer a little bit. Um, I, a lot of people don't know this, maybe I've said on the channel before, but, um, most people don't. I wanted to be an actor when I was your age, like so bad. And I watch movies every day. I still do, but like I watch movies constantly. Um, and I went to New York to audition for a big fancy acting school that a bunch of fancy actors went to and I got in. Um, but I never actually attended because for me, that was like the first hurdle of like, you know, do you really want this? And I stumbled over it and I realized I didn't really want it enough. And I was kind of scared of being in debt for 40 grand a year and waiting tables in New York. And I just, anyway, so I decided that that's not what I wanted to do. And then I tried a bunch of other, but in the background, music was always the constant kind of theme, but you zigzag and you move around and you try things and you get fired from stuff. And then you think you're going to be good at something. And then you realize life like slaps you in the face and is like, no, you're not good at this. But music was always a constant for me. And, you know, by the time I was like 27, 28, I was just about to do a PhD um, from which I withdrew. And I went into audio engineering full time, but I was DJing and I had the piano lessons too. And I was in bands and all the rest of it. But I'm happy that I stayed out of music for that long because I just have like a skin and an aptitude and an attitude um, for rolling with this weird industry that I'm currently in now. Because <laughs> as you might know, it's not just composing that I do. Thankfully, it's also I work in the audio industry and I get to travel and do stuff with a company called Isotope and it's a lot of fun. But um, I don't know if I would have been ready for it at 23, 24. I don't think I would have been mature enough to deal with this world. And honestly, um, if you want to be just a composer and that's all you want to do is compose, I don't know if that job is available anymore. I just don't, I don't know if it is. It's like saying you just want to be a DJ. I don't. Most DJs have to produce their own music in addition to DJing it. You can't just, I mean, if I guess if you're like Jackmaster or like something, you can just be a DJ, but it's very, very, very rare. So all this to say, um, there is something to be said for just living a little bit and then having all that color, your experiences later on when you go to make music seriously. And this idea that, you know, is it possible for me to become a composer? Just that sentence alone, that fragment in that sentence is really kind of squishy and weird to me because you don't have to do something for a chunk of time to be able or to give yourself permission to call yourself a composer. As far as I'm concerned, if you take photos and you love it and you dedicate yourself to it, even if four or five years haven't gone by, you're allowed to call yourself a photographer. If you draw and paint and create stuff, I think you're allowed to call yourself an artist, even if four or five years haven't gone by. So if you're making music now and you have a place uh, where you can drop it and have people listen to it and all the rest of it, then I'm pretty sure you're a composer. I don't understand why we have to give ourselves time and experience and fill up an IMDB sheet before we can call ourselves the thing that we kind of think and know that we actually are. So just want to get that out there. But I don't know if the job of composer just exists anymore. There's a lot of other stuff that you can do um, and that you might have to do in order to be a composer. This could mean that you have to work in a studio and do studio stuff or be an apprentice for someone or uh, have a bunch of different jobs in the industry. And then composing is one thing that you do. And before you know it, you get resources and connections, and then you can just devote everything you have to being a composer. But I think in your journey, if you actually want to take this seriously, which I really don't think you should, I don't think you should spend the next five years, 
you know, 17, 18 to 23, like focusing on, comp I just think it's a bad move. You can do it on the side and you can travel with a laptop and a crappy MIDI keyboard and travel and make music anywhere. But if I were you, if I got to go back to 17, I would like, I wouldn't change anything. I would still go into audio at like late twenties. I would have this life where I was like a spaceship just, and that's what I was just sucking up ever like just music and art and culture and everything. And now that I'm older and I still can't play very well, I really can't. That's why I don't do any like live stuff where I'm playing It bring you guys to tears. It's awful. Um, I, you know, it takes me time. It takes me time to compose and think and come up with something really good. Um, you know, I, 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 I just, I, I think that you should live your life now and maybe wait until it's a little bit later though I have to be careful because you are at least as for all I know technically a woman <laughs> so um, it's different for women men can start over and this is where it might get kind of tricky and I might get some comments but men can shift around and start over but with women it's like you know you hit 25 26 and you start thinking you know this is the, the window where I I should maybe start thinking about having a family and starting a family just because that's the way it is and whether you think the the clock is is BS now or whatever for a lot of people that I know and that I've been with it's not BS and it becomes a serious question so um, but I still I still think I'm right I still think I wouldn't do anything differently if I was your age um, but then again, I'm a dude, so it's a bit different. But I really think that there's a lot of life yet to be lived for you before you decide to, to tunnel vision. And um, the best decision I made was to do it when I could make when I was mature enough and old enough to make calculated risks. Um, and music is one of those things where you need a really thick skin, and you need a good attitude, and you need discipline and commitment to continue to produce and deal with the weirdness and craziness of this industry. Because it is weird, it is crazy, um, and you need the right kind of tools. And you get those tools through experience, really. Um, that being said, Maria, I think it's a good idea to start creating stuff now whatever your plan is for the next five years, if it involves going to school or whatever, I'd say just forget about it. Just build an amazing body of work, watch videos, learn from people, but like travel and stuff, learn from people traveling and going around or whatever, but build a body of work that you can look back on year after year, day after day and, and track your progress. And then you have this amazing body of work that you can go shop and leverage to get other jobs and things like that. It's one thing I see a lot of people not doing. They're more focused with the learning part and not the creating part. And just, you have to create every, I'm into photography now. I'm not a great photographer, but like it really is. It's like time plus experience equals like mastery of something. So you really need to create a lot and learn from your mistakes and 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 just fail a lot and a lot of people kind of play it safe and watch tutorials and learn stuff and go to school but they don't make stuff because that's the scary part it's like starting and doing it so i'd say start and do it and see where your limits are and your weaknesses are um but like you have a lot of life to live just stay out of music as long as you can <laughs> and then when you've absolutely done everything else be like okay now i'm going to focus and commit and hopefully you'll have a, a really awesome um, set of songs and a, a great you know website and just a bunch of stuff where you can be like okay I'm gonna turn I'm gonna flip the switch I'm gonna flip the switch that scared me for a second flip the switch and 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 go into like pro composer mode um, because I'm done with all the you know the fun and traveling and all the rest of it um, that would be my weird discursive ridiculous advice to you and hopefully you're still watching and listening and and nodding but if you have any other questions or comments you know just hit me up all right so this next question comes to me from a guy named dion he says i live near toronto canada that's where i live in toronto and i've decided to go to an audio recording school i'm just interested in recording producing engineering etc in a studio i'm also interested in live sound and even acoustics that's a lot it's a lot of stuff to be interested in i'm curious what you'd recommend for making uh beats slash music i know i have to get pro tools for recording and editing aspect of the school i think i read that right what would be some good programs to produce or create my own beats thanks for your time so there's a few different questions in here the first one is you're well you're interested in a lot of stuff uh what would yeah what would i recommend for making beats and music so 
you, just so you know, uh, this is where Avid has succeeded in, uh, you know, mind controlling the world. You don't need Pro Tools to, for recording and editing. I mean, you're. I think what you what you mean here is that for for the school part, and it is true that in school they use Pro Tools. But if you're going to go to an audio recording school or program, or whatever, you're going to learn Pro Tools. If anything, <laughs> audio recording schools are like Pro Tools, you know. Pro Tools factories. They just teach you how to use Pro Tools and, and a bunch of other stuff too. But it is the industry standard, but you don't really need it these days. Um, any other DAW will do literally. And you have even some of, and I happen to know because I, I work and talk to a lot of these people now in the industry, a lot of people moving away from Pro Tools and going uh, for like Reaper or Studio One is a big, you know, heat seeker one, super popular logic. Um, anyway, so just so you know, uh, for making your own beats and producing your own beats. Uh, another thing here is that like, I, I would say, and I don't know if you mean programs like school programs or like computer programs. If you mean school programs, I would say this is one area in which I think that schools and the kind of curriculum is going to fail you, Dion. I don't think schools have done a good job of keeping up with the needs and wants of young emerging, you know, recording, mixing, produce, whatever. They just haven't. They're kind of stuck in this like, we have a Neve console and you can plug a guitar into it and, you know, here's a pop filter and check out pro tools and tap to transient like th that's where schools are for the most at least in, in canada anyway there's a lot of really good schools um in the states that have more of a focus on this at like berkeley college of music in boston and somewhere else have some really cool programs where there's i think an emphasis on beat construction and beat making i know the school that i went to recording arts canada uh, in the last year or so, they've revamped their curriculum to include beat making and that kind of stuff. I think I might be wrong on that, but I just haven't checked in in a long time with that school because a lot of people went away and it got kind of crazy. So, but I know they were planning on doing that to kind of respond to people like you who want to put a bunch of money into an education and get something out of it. So, if you mean programs, I would say schools aren't really doing it the best you can do and i'm not saying this lightly is the internet it's incredible what you can learn there are uh not just like you know great amateur videos online and i know because at isotope we work with these people we call them influencers that influence a lot of people and they have a youtube channel and they make beats and that's all they do is they make beats and and they're really good at it and super talented and we you know like to connect with them and make sure that they are using our stuff and like it and if they have questions we can tweak it or whatever like they're a very important class of users and they make incredible content that you can learn from reddit is another place where a lot of the stuff is aggregated and sorted out and you can learn from reddit um i had something else i was going to say now i've forgotten it that's right so you have the amateur side so aggregate uh sites like reddit will put you know different influencers in context or you can just go and slog through youtube or even instagram there's a lot of influencers there but you've got people on the pro side as well like ask video pure mix dot net uh linda i can hear my mouth sounds and it's creeping me out one second um by the way if you want to clear up mouth sounds potato chips do a really good job but all i have is water so Lynda.com, Pure Mix, Ask Video is another good one where they have a lot of like beat construction, beat making stuff. So um, I'd say don't worry about school. Worry about, you know, uh, just internet and learn is, is the best thing to do. If you do mean software, uh, obviously, like any software, any sequencing software will do it for you. Um, Logic is kind of the classic MIDI um, driven software program. People might be cringing as I say that, but they just have one of the most flexible MIDI systems out there. Uh, I think they started out as a MIDI sequencer actually before they were like a fully fleshed uh, DAW. So there's that. Um, Cubase is another one that a lot of people love. Ableton is another one that a lot of people love. Uh, Pro Tools is usually not really thought of as a MIDI sequencing um, tool. It's mostly thought of as, I think you mentioned here, recording and editing. 
sweet. Uh, it does have some pretty intense, you know, capable MIDI functionality, but it is not thought of and regarded as such. So there's other programs and stuff that you can use. But if you want to create and produce your own stuff, I would say YouTube, internet, learn from people around you, try and make connections in your community. I don't know the beat making community that much, but we've also got stuff in Toronto like uh, Loop, which I think is an event that's run by Native Instruments, and they'll pop in every now and then, or maybe it's Ableton that does that. But you've got like Moog Audio or Moog Audio, Long and McQuaid do seminars as well, and then you've got Native Instruments and Ableton and people that show up and do like beat making seminars and stuff like that. So um, a lot of different cool stuff, but stay away from traditional education as far as beat making is concerned, in Canada anyway. I just don't think it's going to serve you. All right. Uh, this one comes to me from Jacob Stevens. Here's a scary thing, everyone. Um, not just that I use your full names on the internet and just out you, uh, whether you want me to or not. I don't know if I've answered this one before. I have no idea. This is how rarely I look into the rear view mirror of the channel and go back on the old. I don't know. Uh, maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. If I did, it'll be very fun to compare the answers, see if I'm at all like intellectually consistent and like reasonable. But <laughs> let's see. Um, Jacob Stevens, he says, hi, Jeff. Uh, this is from May. So if Jacob's still <laughs> watching the channel, um, thank you. Uh, first, I want to say that you are the most articulate and listenable music production YouTuber. All right, Jacob, I'm listening. Uh, my wife asks me to turn you up. Here we go. When I watch your videos, even though she has no interest in music production, just because your voice is so structured and reassuring. She never says that about my voice. Should that worry me? I don't know. I don't know, man. Um, it's flattering. It's very flattering. Uh, here are three ideas from less to more abstract. Let's jump in. So idea number one, maybe this is question number one. Whenever I mix on good monitors or headphones, I add too much bass. I think it's because I'm so used to over-bassed Boses, movie theaters, car stereos, etc., that I think every mix should make me nauseous. But when I mix what I think is enough bass on flat monitors, there's just way too much on every other speaker. Sometimes I think I do a better job just mixing on my old Harman Kardon sound sticks, since that's what I've been listening to since junior high. I'm super old now, but that doesn't seem very pro. Do you have better ideas, he writes. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in this question because there's a lot going on in this question. Um, first off, I guess we have to define our terms a little bit. So I'm very curious to know what you mean when you say add base. I mean, if, if we had to salami up the spectrum, I would say zero to 250 cycles would be your low end, 250 to maybe... Um, 3.5k 4k would be your mid and everything above that would be your treble or your high so i'm wondering if when you say you're adding too much bass if you're adding 0 to 250 or if you're maybe hanging out somewhere in the 100 to maybe 300 or 400 cycle range which is kind of considered to be low mids so i'm i'm wondering about that maybe you can follow up with me and and clarify because those two things can have uh, different uh, effects on the perceptual loudness of an overall signal. So I don't know what you consider to be bass and what yeah what is bass for you and, and, and where you're adding and where you find that, that bass is, is lacking. So that's just the first thing that I think I just need to at least articulate before I move on to the rest here. The second thing you're saying is, and you seem to know what you, you, you do know what you mean here, and that's that the way it should go is that you should be mixing on a neutral system, uh, something that offers as objective and not flat, but is sort of, um, yeah, objective as possible, a kind of frequency spectrum so that what you're hearing is, you know, what you're getting. And then when it goes on to another system and translates to beats or your, you know, your sound sticks or whatever, um, and that bump, the coloration is added, put in by the manufacturer or whatever, um, it should sound consistent with modern music and because that's just the way it is. And the fact that that's not happening is definitely curious. I don't know why that isn't happening. Um, you mentioned that you are a little bit older. It could be, and don't take this the wrong way, it could be a, a loss in 
your your own hearing and your own drivers in here. I don't think that's actually what's happening though. Um, it there's just so many factors is what I'm trying to say. I don't know the kind of music that you're mixing, uh, the kind of stuff that you're listening to. If you're adding artificial bass boosts just to the stuff that you're getting um, when you're, let me just turn off the the little notifications here. Um, yeah, like I don't know if you're just casual listening to stuff and you like that bass boost. It could be that you just have like a natural pro- proclivity to listen to stuff that's bass heavy, you know, and, and the stuff that you're doing just isn't really cutting it and you want a huge bass boost. But you do say that when you mix on flat monitors and, and bring it somewhere else, um, it's just way too much bass on every other speaker. I just don't know why that's happening. There's another factor in here and that's just the fact that most music has just come up tremendously in um, in low frequency output. It's just everything has way too much bass now that, um, you know, our own perception of how much low end is too much is, is skewed. I don't know. Um, but like you seem to notice here, um, you're getting the inverse. It should be that you mix on a flat monitor and you translate and it sounds great once you get that natural coloration and uh, boost um, of, of low end frequencies, which uh, Bose is, 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 I think known for the more known for bumping up mids than anything. And also adding sparkle. So like seven to like, I don't know, seven to 11 or 12 K. So I don't know what's happening. That's the thing. Um, while it might not seem very pro to mix, uh, on Harman Kardon sound sticks, you know, you do have a lot of pros that will at least reference and use as a secondary monitor or, or output playback system. They'll, you know, use a crappy speaker or something just to hear how it's going to sound for the majority of people. And now it seems to be that like the new NS10 is Apple's AirPods or earbuds or whatever it is. I don't know how true that is because I still like I, I mix mostly on my Focals and I have my NS10Ms um, and I use these guys here, these um Sennheiser HD 650s. They're great. Sorry, my b- spells are still going off here. Um, and these are these are wonderful. I would say, I don't know what's happening with your system, Jacob, but get yourself a pair of these if you can. HD 650s, Sennheiser, just the right amount of pretty much everything in there such that when you do move it on to another system, you get a really great uh, translation. But there's also other things you can do. I would say if you're not doing this already, you should, and that's really measure things with metering and see where you're stacking up and where this perceived response is coming from. So um, this is not to, you know, isotope everything. I try and not even mention the name of the company on this channel too much, but we do make a lot of really good metering tools. Like we have this thing called Insight 2. Um, and it just allows you to get like a bird's eye view of what's happening tonally, level wise, you know, uh, true peak, everything. So you can really see what's happening with your mix. We have a thing called tonal balance control, same thing. It just slices up the, the spectrum into different sections and you can see where the overall energy is being distributed. So I'd be curious to know if, you know, when you play stuff back, um, just, you know, stuff that you like or think is really well mixed, where's that all fitting, you know, and what's the stuff that you're trying to mix and where is that all fitting when you throw it in insight or tonal balance control or just pull up a, a free frequency spectrum analyzer if you have one in your digital audio workstation. Just see where that is and see if you can do a little bit of work to quantify what's happening and what you're hearing um, would be my guess. But without sound examples and all the rest of it, I don't really know if I can help you because it shouldn't be this way. It should be the other way, the way that you're saying. Um, but just to button up things for your first question, you know, do what sounds right to you. Um, it is a great idea to be listening across multiple different listening devices um, to make sure that you are translating smoothly between different things. It might sound great on the sticks, but in the car it sounds a different way and in a club it will sound a different way and all the rest of it. So just know that. But yeah, sorry, dude, this is, you're kind of stumping me a little bit, but hopefully I gave you a little bit to think of. Let's move to your second question here. Next question. I'm sure this is like, he says, by far 
your most common question, but what plugins and sample libraries should a poor dude buy? Is NI Native Instruments Ultimate versus non-Ultimate worth it? What about the more expensive stuff from Spitfire, Sonic Couture, etc.? I know the answer is it depends on what you're making, but a lot of us who are early in our careers don't really know what we're making. We get random gigs and are happy to make anything from 8-bit retro to pieces recorded with 344 of the finest musicians recorded at the legendary Air Studios. Um, okay, so, yes, the marketing is effective, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I do get this question all the time. I, I'll tell you what not to do, Jacob. What not to do is to uh, go, you know, sucking up every single thing that you can get your hands on, free or paid or cracked or whatever, and until you have this bloated hard drive with so much stuff that you just don't have the time to sift through it all when you do get called upon to make some music for picture. That's the worst um, because it drains your bank account um, and it, it just it just it's just paralysis by analysis. You don't want to have so much that you're just spending all your time indexing and categorizing and it's just not a good look. So don't do that. Um, and I know that that's the attitude. It's like, well, I better have it in case a director comes over and says, hey, I need you to do this. Or, hey, do you happen to have this, like, you know, I don't know, 17th century friggin' I, I'm trying to think of some wackadoo instrument, but I can't. And you just don't be that person. Um, if you do want to have, like, everything and all the stuff, I would say that, like, Native Instruments is pretty good. Or, there are, or like... All of Native Instruments' newer stuff for um, orche orchestral composing is really good compared to their older stuff. Whereas if you're making electronic music and producing and all, producing, making electronic stuff and beats and all the rest of it, their older stuff incomplete is, I think, just as useful and good sounding as their newer stuff. So there's a real benefit if you are looking to go piece by piece instead of all in with native instruments. I think you can go piece by piece getting the newer stuff from them as opposed to getting complete ultimate um, and finding out that you can actually, you know, only really use, I say, 40% of the orchestral stuff that comes in complete ultimate. I, I, I know that might be a kind of sacrilegious thing to say from like the native instruments purists out there, but I don't think they were really thinking of composers you know, pre complete eight and complete nine. I think only with like 10, 11, and 12 uh, were they really sort of targeting composers, bedroom composers, putting them in their crosshairs and building tools that sounded really great for them. Because if anything, you know, you had uh, East West kind of falling out of favor with people. The samples were kind of old, it was very expensive. Spitfire came out of nowhere and just started to like, they just had this in between where the price point and the marketing was good and the samples were really beautiful. And then Spitfire caught, or Native Instruments caught on and whatever. And then East West was and still kind of is in the dust from that. Um, so honestly, for the Native Instruments complete stuff, I'd say you can go piece by piece. That's how I would do it. Wait for a summer sale where things are half off or whatever it happens to be. Um, let's go one by one. The next thing is Spitfire and Sonic Couture. I think that Spitfire is more expensive than Sonic Couture. And Sonic Couture is more of a boutique company where they make kind of like odds and ends weird stuff. It's all gorgeous, mind you. But I don't think if you are opening yourself up to any and every gig, um, from directors and all that you will be able to make a lot of stuff that they will like if you restrict yourself to a sonic couture palette because sonic couture stuff is just so unique and and left field and weird i think you would be better off to go the spitfire route honestly because they've got the lab stuff which is free and getting revamped and sounds pretty darn good i think um and then you've also got uh, the more expensive offerings, which are going more and more on sale now. Um, and I think something like one of the Albions will get you where you need to go. So like Albion 1, 2, or... Th well, Albion 1 is probably most... It's probably all most people need, to be quite honest with you, is Albion 1. Albion 5 is also a favorite of mine. So like if, if you wanted to spend you know, a little, it's all relative, but I would say 
go for like Albion 5 and all the lab stuff and you'll be good because you get percussion with Albion 5, you get strings, horns, everything, and then you have all the free lab stuff, which is like bits and bobs. And that's, I think, a really good starting point. I don't think anyone really needs to have everything that Sonic Couture makes. To me, that's like a piece by piece company. Um, and then you've got the other electronic stuff, and there's a company that you haven't mentioned that I think do an even better job than um, Native Instruments does when it comes to electronic stuff with respect to scoring and composing, and that's Spectrosonics. They make a power synth called Omnisphere 2. It's Omnisphere, but they're on their second iteration. In fact, they're 2.5 now, and they just have an incredible suite of tools, uh, and they've even got some like stuff that I haven't... I have to admit, I mean, I know a lot about Omnisphere. I haven't bought it yet, <laughs> but it's so well regarded that I can say with confidence that it's something that should at least be on your radar, Jacob. So uh, they make stuff in there that rivals, I think, even some of the best Spitfire stuff for orchestral stuff, so like strings and percussion, all the rest of it. It's a pretty incredible instrument, Omnisphere 2. Um, and I know it's kind of BS for me to say that without any credibility because I don't have it, but I... Anyway, I'm in the industry, and it's all a lot of people like to talk about. So um, hopefully that kind of answers the question. 344 of the finest musicians. I feel like you're secretly referring to uh, Zimmer Strings, which uh, I have, but I haven't actually downloaded yet. So I should download and make a video, although I'll be like the last voice, and no one's going to really watch that video. Uh, for that instrument, but um, you will also need some solo stuff, solo strings, because um, you'll need like a first chair section, or you'll need some solo -y things or whatever. I've said it a thousand times, but I really think that VR Harmonic makes some of the best solo stuff. Um, orchestral Tools, breaking the bank a bit, but they make some incredible solo stuff as well. Um, so look into those two companies, but I feel pretty good about my answer in that Spitfires, either Albion 1 or 5, they're different flavors, but you get pretty much everything, plus the lab stuff is probably a good a good place to go. And if you like what you're hearing, some of the softer stuff with the strings in Albion 5, but it's a little bit too kind of grainy and woodsy and over the top and like hipster and Christian in a, I don't know, in a blimp hovering over the Arctic with a drone going in reverse... Anyway, um, then <laughs> try uh, try chamber strings, which is a little bit softer and uh, just a bit more kind of general and kind of cinematic and elegant and romantic uh, from Spitfire. In fact, I think they expanded it recently, so try that. That would be my answer for number two. Um, but yeah, I know it, it depends on what you're making and all the rest of it, and we don't know what we're making, but the last thing you want to do, dude, really is is just suck everything up and just run the credit card and your wife will just turn me off every time you throw a video on because she'll be like, that's the dude that's responsible for our debt. For our debt, you have to put your house up and have to move out and it's just going to be a mess. Um, number three, I'd really like to know your process from the very inception of a project until you start mixing. Are you sitting down and writing a bunch of uh, okay, are you just loading chamber strings and playing along like you're in orchestral mystery science theater, outlining a whole movie in rough form, then polishing as you go, or making each moment great as soon as you can? That's your last question. Thanks for all you do, Jacob. All right, so number three. So I feel like I answered this question in other videos scattered along the way, but especially to the one that I wrote for, uh, the one that started this video where the guy asked me like, what's the, how do you write a cue? Where does it come from? What's the first thing you do? Blah, blah, blah. So, but to sum it up, um, I do not, I don't have a template. I know I did a video a little while ago where I was talking about like, shortcuts and things and I said do templates and what that means is you have your logic session or you have Cubase or whatever DAW you pray to every night and you have it open up to a template where you have a section for horns, strings, whatever um, so that you can just start writing in those with those instruments and those colors right away. I used to do that for a little while and then I just hated it because I just I felt like I don't know. It took a long time to load on the system that I had and everything. So I, and this is not me advocating for you to do this, Jacob. It's just like, I start from scratch every time, <laughs> every time. And also every cue gets its own session. So what this means is even if the song 
or the piece of audio that I'm writing is 30 seconds long, it gets its own logic folder and file and structure and pack. Um, it's just the way that I do it. It's probably very inefficient and sloppy. And if anyone were to come in and investigate and I had an assistant and they were to take over because I couldn't write something, which would never, ever be the case because I'm very precious about my work and no one can touch it, um, I, it, it'd be a nightmare. Uh, so I think that... <laughs> For me, it's it's always super rough. Um, polishing as I go is a good way to put it. Um, and it's something that starts from scratch every time. And there's a lot of trial and error. And like I said in the earlier answer, it's one of the reasons I don't do live streams. And I don't, you know, because it's me. And even though I'll be in this room for six hours, I'll maybe check my email, watch a video, write it, whatever, and then kind of come back to it. And then like, you know, listen to music or whatever. It's very interrupted and all over the place but it's just the way that I work I just can't I can't be like a monk that goes to the mountain and just emerges five days later with like a full score I just can't it has to be choppy and and from scratch and full of mistakes and you know tell the girlfriend I'm gonna be in bed like at two in the morning because I have to work and that's just the way it is every time for me it has to start from scratch and it has to be messy and and all over the place but that being said you know, sometimes when you're composing um, something which might feel like it's going to be really laborious and all over the place, you get it done in like 20 minutes. You know, you fire it off to the director and they're like, love it, slotted it in, you know, just checked it perfect, you know, amazing, awesome. And they don't know that it took you 20 minutes. They don't know that it's, maybe it's just you press one key and a pad just evolves or whatever, and then you add something over it and mix it and you're done. They don't have to know that that took two minutes, you know. So whatever gets you there, whatever system works for you, and you're going to have to develop that on your own and figure it out. I've done a couple of videos on how to stay. And one of the first videos I ever do is how to stay inspired and how to, you know, tap into creativity and keep it moving and keep the uh, momentum going. Unlike my thought process in this video. <laughs> um, so um, I encourage you to, to check that out. But um, usually it works like that. Start from scratch. Then when it comes to mixing and all that, um, mixing is something I do separately. So like I will have the idea in the roughest form ready to go in my DAW, uh, all the tracks, everything there. But after I've written and composed everything, I won't add any more MIDI or any more notes. I will leave it alone and then start bringing the plugins in and start doing a basic fader mix and then start working with panning. Um, and EQing stuff and unmasking stuff if I find that one instrument is competing for space with another more important instrument or whatever and then there'll be some grouping and maybe some effects and delay and all the rest of it but usually that if there is any structure to what I do it's it's that so everything is crystallized as far as the melody and all that goes um, the odd time uh, when I'm mixing I will go oh you know I need to going to rewrite that part and usually honestly the craziest it ever gets is um i'll hit option and just duplicate something onto another midi track and add an instrument so that something maybe goes up or down an octave i'll transpose it and it'll have something that follows it just to fill it out i'm not rewriting anything a lot of people like to mix as they go and for me it's just not a, a thing i like to do um so yeah, so that's the extent of my going back and correcting notes after I have arranged and composed something. I guess just composed something. And then the mastering part is really just me making sure that my levels are all okay. And I'll usually go through with Insight. Um, Isotope makes it. Uh, and I'll look at what the integrated uh, LUFS number is for the whole program audio. And if it's I'll just write it down what it is and if it needs to come up on the next track I'll just I'll find a level that's pretty even um, uh, so that it's it's even enough maybe it's minus 14 for every single cue or minus 16 or minus 20 or something like that um, and then you have to be aware of you know is it going to another mixer is it going to go to a re-recording mixer it's going to take everything and bounce it all down and make sure that it's good for like a broadcast spec or something. I think usually it's like minus 23 LUFS is for broadcast, but my stuff doesn't ever really go on television. It goes mostly to like a film festival or something like that where you can be a bit more lax with the loudness uh, standards and stuff like that. But usually I'll never write anything that's really uh, above minus 20 LUFS really, unless it's going on a SoundCloud, in which case I'll probably like fire it up and make it a little bit louder. Um, but yeah. 
Um, that's the composing, that's the mixing part, and just basic level work at the mastering stage to make sure that the overall body of the sound is consistent with the energy of all the other tracks so that when I do line everything up and hand it over to the director, or if I'm doing that work myself, things are really consistent um, you know, between tracks. And end of the day, uh, things always get turned down anyway, especially music, right, because dialogue is king. So, uh, But you do want to maintain good kind of gain hygiene and, and make sure that things are still nice and kind of loud, even if they are going to get turned down. Uh, the worst is when you <laughs> do all that fader work and you hand it over, and they don't just turn it down, but they put like reverb on it, which just drives me crazy. That happens a lot. Anyway. Hopefully it doesn't happen to you. So there you go, Jacob. Super long-winded answers to your uh, very thoughtful, insightful, titillating questions. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let's move on to the very last question, which is a, uh, a a song that somebody wants me to listen and critique. So we'll do that. And this person has waited a long time, like a lot of other people. So let me read you that question. Okay, now we've reached the end of our podcast. Um, last question. Richard Dunn is his name. Hey, Jeff Manchester of Manchester Music. He writes with, exc with an exclamation point. We briefly spoke on YouTube about reviewing a track. Let me just quickly say how much I appreciate you doing this. It's really great of you. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I'll get right into it. I've made three kind of similar piano tracks, he writes, uh, Adieu, Inevitable Dilemma, and I'm not sure about the mix and master, but those things are kind of the same for me, question mark, question mark, he writes. So I don't need you to go through all of the tracks in their entirety, of course, but have a listen to, be to the beginning of them till the double bass kicks in. Is there too much low end, he asks. Should the piano be louder? There might be too much reverb, also weakening the piano. What are your thoughts on that? I feel like the track Dilemma sounds more balanced and clear compared to the other ones. Thanks for taking the time. Love the videos. You're quite funny too. I'm, I'm already subscribed to you, but would you like to follow me on SoundCloud or somewhere else? As you know, a transaction, he writes. Hustling. Always hustling. Okay, let's listen to uh, his track. I'm going to throw my headphones on, and hopefully he was, he's okay with me. Um, sharing some of this with you the audio with you guys all right okay i pop my headphones on i'm going to be taking notes on what i'm hearing i have not heard this song before so it's going to be the first time first time first time real time on the channel on the manchester music channel first time for richard dunn and let's go now over to the track
Okay, uh, Dick Dunn, thanks for sending this over. A couple things. Uh, is this, yeah, this is on. Okay. So a few things I wrote notes down. Um, overall, I think this makes for a very, very good mock-up. Uh, I think this could be something that could be transcribed and ostensibly, you know, given to someone to give to players, and this could really come to life. Um, I have a few thoughts about what I was hearing. The first is uh, reverb and delay, uh, which I think you have a lot of um, on the pianos. I think there's like two piano tracks, or maybe there's a right hand, left hand thing, but there's a lot of pianos. It makes me feel like there's two. Um, when you add a lot of time-based effects or time-based effects and a lot of them, like delay and reverb and chorus and all the rest, um, this has a tendency to do a few things to the track and you need to be aware of those. The first is it will often uh, dull the intensity, especially the percussive intensity of things. Like when you add you know, a lot of, for example, if you had like a drum kit or whatever on one track and you added a bunch of reverb to it, uh, it would lose the attack, the, those transients and the sharpness of them would lose a lot of definition. So when you have a, an instrument like a piano, which is very similar um, in kind of nature and ballistics and behavior to drums and that they're both very like, you know, um, hammers and mallets and things hitting, um, you have to be careful that you don't take too much definition out with reverb. Um, and a way to get around this is just to use less, you know, or to have an EQ somewhere at the end of the reverb um, or beginning or depending on how you're routing things. Um, the Beatles did this a lot where they have basically, a, they create a pocket for the articulation of the reverb. They did this with vocals, but you can do the same thing with piano where you have, you know, a curve that looks something like this where you're going like that and then like this. So you're high passing and low passing. Um, but you're also dipping a little bit to create a pocket for the articulation of the piano to come through. So you're basically EQing the reverb so that you do have some reverb and it's some le not levity, but you have some air um, on the on the piano track, but you also have the best of the other world, which is the dry coming through. And there's some tips and techniques on how to add reverb um, and are, you know, make sure the articulation comes across with an EQ. Just write and type into Google like, you know, uh, EQ to reverb. I, I can count on my hand the number of times I've used uh, a reverb without an EQ. So um, it's something I always do and everyone should always do. The other thing is de delay time. See if you can reduce the wet dry on the delay as well. It just adds, there's a bit too much going on. You want it to be almost in like the Haas zone, which is uh, this zone that refers to basically an area sort of within zero to 40 milliseconds or so, anything outside of 40 milliseconds on the delay time will uh, make the, the second voice, the kind of delayed added voice noticeable. Whereas if it's within that zero to 40 millisecond window, you just get a kind of thickening, which is really nice. If you go beyond that, you hear the second voice and it gets a bit slapbacky and you go further, it gets even more kind of delay. So what I suspect is that you've got your delay time a little generous. Um, and it just basically causes the piano or whatever you're putting it on to lose a lot of definition. But if that's what you're going for, then cool, do that. That's fine. But I would say with great, you know, power with time-based effects comes a lot of responsibility and uh, your track can get really kind of not swampy, but very kind of hazy very quickly if you're not controlling your time-based effects. It's it's very tempting to throw reverb and delay on stuff to make it sound big and epic, but um, yeah, be careful because you, you might lose some sharpness, and I think you've lost a little bit um, in this track, but you can fix it. The, the next thing with time-based effects is that, um, you know, especially when you're playing in stereo, uh, you have, um, you know, time-based effects will accentuate things on the left and right and make things move around even more. Um, that's why it's really hard to isolate stuff um, like vocals and all that from the rest of the track when there's a lot of reverb because that stuff just washes around left to right. So what I mean is, you know, if you have too much reverb going on and you have instruments that are hard pan and all the rest of it, when you go and play this track back, you know, mono, um, a lot of information gets lost because you're kind of out of phase. So take a look at 
open up a phase correlation meter and just see where you're hitting. I think you're probably a little bit too wide and too panned. And then you add reverb and delay onto that and just spreads things out even more. So that when you, if you do go to mono, if this was to play back on a mono device, you would, you know, your pianos would kind of disappear. So try, um, a lot of, there's a lot of free plugins out there that will, you know, you just hit a switch and it'll flip to mono and just see what happens. I think you might be a little bit too liberal with your panning and with your reverb uh, and delay, which again can kind of make things way wider than they need to be. Uh, so just check that and, and, and be careful of that. The next thing that I wrote is um, it's the same thing for the voice. I think there's like a synthetic voice that comes in at the very beginning. It comes in left, at least in my headphones, if I had them on the right way. Um, again, just see if you can narrow that a little bit, make it more like, you know, 11 o'clock as opposed to nine o'clock or five o'clock or not five o'clock, um, seven o'clock or something like that. It's super panned over here. Just try and bring a little bit more over there again, in case we do go to mono, um, People often, it's one thing I did all the time is I pan way harder left, right uh, than I needed to when I was first starting out and mixing. Like you don't need to pan that much. Um, that's a stylistic choice. You can leave it there if you want, but see what it, what it sounds like again when you flip to mono. Um, the violin sounds very synthy, um, and that's why I said at the beginning it sounds like it's a good mock up, like it could be given to a violin player and they could whatever. Um, now, this is one of those things where, you know, you could add a bit of reverb to kind of disguise some reverb and some chorusing and some delay to disguise the kind of pitchiness of the violin. If I were you, I'd just turn it down a little bit, even though I know it's a solo instrument and it's meant to kind of carry some of the piece. Um, it just sounds... It, see if you can get your hands on a more um, realistic sounding violin, especially like a first chair violin or something. Um, and Spitfire just came out with the solo string stuff. Um, something in your DAW, whatever you're using, could could sound pretty good too. But it just sounds a little mechanical and MIDI, uh, to my ears anyway. Um, but I thought the piano was very delicate and very real, very natural. It sounds like you might be a piano player, because that's the instrument I think that sounds the most kind of personal and honest to me. Um, the pads were nice, some transitions were really nice going back and forth and stuff. But I feel like the violin or whatever you're using is maybe not the thing that you're most comfortable with. So you're kind of relying on another program to take care of that. And to me, it's just not sounding as real as the other stuff in your track. Um, the next thing is that there's, and this is a really good note for most people listening to this. Hopefully, if you've made it to the end of this channel, you're still here. You have to be so careful when you're uploading to services like SoundCloud or even YouTube. Like you have to listen back and see what they've done to your track. I don't know if it's necessarily SoundCloud's fault or if it's something that you've done on your end, but there's a pop that appears at 202. Um, I don't think it's your fault because it sounds like you, know, you probably listened to your track a lot. It's only two minutes long, so you would have listened to it before you uploaded it. But if you notice, there's <clears throat> this little click that happens uh, around, it's, maybe it's not 202, maybe it's like 155 or something like that. It's a dropout and I was able to recreate it because I played it back a few different times and it still kept showing. I don't know what's causing it. It could be a sample rate issue or a buffer setting or you, maybe you went from like AIFF down to MP3 or AAC or something and during that conversion there was a something that caused some some clipping or a click or something like that but there's a clear dropout and that's something that you definitely have to take care of before you throw it onto soundcloud because when you put your music out there for the world um you never know who's going to be listening you just never know i had this one dude who who mixed a commercial like a toothpaste commercial and he was contacted by some dude in sweden who saw the canadian toothpaste commercial and was like i love the way that commercial was mixed you know, do you want to work for me? And he got a gig. It was the weirdest connection, but I'm just saying, listen to what might be happening to your track once it's uploaded by one of these services. SoundCloud happens to be one of the worst offenders as far as like uh, codecs they use for like compressing um, and throw, throwing away information to make the track more easily downloaded and streamed um, and more kind of nimble when, you know, it gets uploaded to the web so people can download and listen to it pretty quickly. A lot of stuff gets taken away. So it could be a codec issue or something. I don't know what's happening, but you, I think you owe it to yourself to go back, 
re-upload it, or identify if the problem is happening on your own end in your DAW and go fix it. Or if you can't fix it because the session's gone, re-download it you know, from SoundCloud if you can. Uh, and just use some kind of tool like RX. Again, this is not. This feels like a big ad for Isotope, but RX. Uh, you know, you've got the declick tool in there. Um, you've got mouth declick tool in there, which could help too, or interpolate in the advanced version of RX, which could help just to get rid of that click. It's pretty noticeable. So, just a good lesson for most people. Once you've uploaded something, it's not the end. Go back and listen to it. Make sure it's unlisted, and if it sounds good to you, then make it public and make it go. But Richard, I think you've done a really good job. I really appreciate your patience. I know you've been asking for a while now. Um, I just only now had time to, to do a vodcast and sit down and do something properly. So um, I think you're off to a great start. The piano is great. I think it could use less reverb, less time-based effects. Be careful about your panning. And when it comes to other instruments that you maybe, maybe aren't kind of your first thing or I'm just making a guess, Bring someone else into the room. Just the act of having someone else there with you changes the way that you hear things. And maybe they'll point out the violin thing, I don't know, but that's just one thing that I noticed. It really just doesn't meet the kind of authenticity of the of the rest of the arrangement and the instruments in the track to have that there. It's a bit too synthy for me. But thank you again for sending me the track and for your patience. Thanks to everyone who watched. Again, Vodcast podcaster at gmail.com if you want <laughs> to write me a question. I'm fading away here. I'm still getting used to the time uh, switch because I was 13 hours into the future in Tokyo and now I'm back into the past in Toronto. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching. Vodcast podcaster at gmail.com. Tweet at Jeff Manch. I couldn't even get through this beer. That's how exhausted I am. But thank you for watching. Uh, the fans are incredible. You guys are amazing. This channel is you you are the channel and that's the best i can do right now for like a pithy way to wrap this vodcast up but take care write me leave a comment i read them all